Chapter 5. In the days that followed, the Baudelaire orphans had pits in their stomachs. In Sunny's case, it was understandable, because when Klaus had divided up the peach, she had gotten the part with the pit. Normally, of course, one does not eat the pit, part of the peach. But Sunny was very hungry and liked to eat hard things, so the pit ended up in her stomach along with the parts of the fruit that you or I might find more suitable. But the pit in the bottlers and the bottler stomachs was not so much from the snack that Charles had given them, but from an overall feeling of doom. They were certain that Count Olaf was lurking nearby, like some predator waiting to pounce on the children while they were while they weren't looking. So each morning when Foreman Lecutano clanged his pots together to wake everyone up. The bottlers took a good look at him to see if Count Olaf had taken his place. It would have been just like Count Olaf to put a white wig, to put on a white wig and a surgical mask over his face and snatch the bottlers right out of their bunk. But Foreman Flecutano always had the same dark and beady eyes, which didn't look a thing like Count Olaf's shiny one. And he always spoke in his rough, muffled voice, which was the opposite of the smooth, snarly voice of Count Olaf. When the children walked across the dirt-covered courtyard to, lumber, to the lumber mill, they took a good look at their fellow employees. It would have been just like Count Olaf to get himself hired as an employee and snatch the orphans away while, the, while foreman, Fleck Utano, wasn't looking. But although all the workers looked tired and sad and hungry, none of them looked evil or greedy or had such an awful manners. And as the orphans performed the back-breaking labor of the lumber mill, the word back-breaking here means so difficult and tiring that it felt like the orphans' backs were breaking, even though they actually weren't. They wondered if Count Olaf would use one of the enormous machines to somehow get his hands on their fortune. But that didn't seem to be the case, either. After a few days of tearing the bark off the trees, the debarkers were put back in the corner, and the giant pinching machine was turned off. Next, the workers had to pick up the barkless trees themselves, one by one, and hold them against the buzzing circular saw until it had sliced each tree into flat boards. The youngsters' arms were soon achy and covered in splinters from lifting all the logs, but Count Olaf did not take advantage of their weakened arms to kidnap them. After a few days of sawing, Foreman Flecutano ordered Phil to start up the machine with the enormous ball of string inside. The machine wrapped the, wrapped the string around small bundles of boards, and the employees had, a ga had, had to gather around and tie the string into very complicated knots to hold the bundles together. The siblings' fingers were soon so sore that they could scarcely hold the coupons they were given each day. But Count Olaf did not try to force them to surrender their fortune. Day after dreary day went by, and although the children were convinced that he must be somewhere nearby, Count Olaf simply did not show up. It was very puzzling. It is very puzzling, Violet said one day during their gum break. Count Olaf is simply nowhere to be found. I know, Klaus said, rubbing his right thumb, which was the sorest. That building looks like his tattoo, and so does that book cover, but Count Olaf himself hasn't shown his face. Alone, Sunny said thoughtfully. She probably meant something like, it is certainly perplexing. Violet snapped her fingers. That Sunny has an amazing vocabulary. Violet snapped her fingers, frowning because it hurt. I've thought of something, she said. Klaus, you just said he hasn't shown his face. Maybe maybe he's, he's Sir in disguise. We can't tell what Sir really looks like because of that cloud of smoke. Count Olaf could have dressed in a green suit and taken up smoking just to fool us. I thought of that too, Klaus said. But he's much shorter than Count Olaf. And I don't know how you can disguise yourself as a much shorter person. Chorn, Sonny pointed out, which meant something like, and his voice sounds nothing like Count Olaf's. That's true, Violet said, and gave Sonny a small piece of wood that was sitting on the floor. Because babies should not have gum. Sonny's older siblings gave her these small tree scraps during the lunch break. Sunny did not eat the wood, of course, but she chewed on it and pretended it was a carrot or an apple or beef and cheese enchiladas, all of which she loved. It might just be that Count Olaf hasn't found us, Klaus said. After all, Parcheville, Paltryville is in the middle of nowhere. It could take him years to track us down. Pally! Sunny exclaimed. We 
which meant something like, but that doesn't explain the I-shaped building or the cover of the book. Those things could just be coincidence, Violet admitted. We're so scared of Count Olaf that maybe we're just thinking we're seeing him everywhere. Maybe he won't show up. Maybe he really, we really are safe here. That's the spirit, said Phil, who had been sitting near them all this time. Look on the bright side. Lucky Smells Lumber Mill might not be your favorite place, but at least there's no sign of this Olaf guy you keep talking about. This might turn out to be the most fortunate part of your lives. I admire your optimism, Klaus said, smiling at Phil. Me too, Violet said. Timpa, Sunny agreed. That's the spirit, Phil said again, and stood up to stretch his legs. The bottle of orphans nodded, but looked at one another out of the corners of their eyes. It was true that Count Olaf hadn't shown up, or at least he hadn't shown up yet, but their situation was far from fortunate. They had to wake up at the clanging of pots and be ordered around by Foreman Flecutano, they only had gum, or in Sonny's case, imaginary enchiladas for lunch. And worst of all, working in the lumber mill was so exhausting that they didn't have the energy to do anything else. Even though she was near complicated, even though she was near complicated machines every day, Violet hadn't even thought about in inventing something for a very long time. Even though Klaus was free to visit Charles Library whenever he wanted. He hadn't even glanced at any of the three books. And even though there were plenty of hard things around to bite, Sunny hadn't closed her mouth around more than a few of them. The children missed studying reptiles with Uncle Monty. They missed living over Lake Latriamos with Aunt Josephine. And most of all, of course, they missed living with their parents, which was there, which was where, after all, they truly belonged. Well, Violet said after a pause, we'll only have to work, work here for a few years. Then I will be of age, and we can use some of the bottle air fortune. I'd like to build an in inventing studio for myself, perhaps over at Lake Latrimos, where Aunt Josephine's house used to be, so we can always remember her. And I'd like to build a library, Klaus said, that would be open to the public, and I'd always hoped that we would buy back Uncle Monty's reptile collection and take care of all the reptiles. Dulk, Sunny shrieked, which meant, and I could, and I could be a dentist. What in the world does Dulk mean? The orphans looked up and saw that Charles had been had come into the lumber mill. He was smiling at them and taking something out of his pocket. Hello, Charles, Violet said. It's nice to see you. What have you been up to? Ironing Sir's shirts, Charles answered. He has lots of shirts. And he's too busy to iron them himself. I've been meaning to come by, but the ironing took a long time. I brought you some beef jerky. I was afraid to take more than a little bit because Sir would know that it was missing. But here you go. Thank you very much, Klaus said politely. We'll share this with the other employees. Well, okay, Charles said. But last week they got a coupon for 30% off beef jerky, so they probably bought plenty of it. Maybe they did, Violet said, knowing full well that there was no way any of the workers could afford beef jerky. Charles, we've been meaning to ask you about one of the books in your library. You know the one with the eye on the cover. Where did you... Violet question, Violet's question was interrupted by the sound of Foreman Flecutano's pots being banged together. Back to work, he shouted. Back to work. We have to finish try, tying these bundles together, so there's no time for chit-chat. I would just like to talk to these children for a few more minutes, Foreman Flecutano, Charles said. Surely we can extend the lunch break just a little bit. Absolutely not, Foreman Flecutano said, striding over to the orphans. I have my orders from Sir, and I intend to carry them out. Unless you'd like to tell Sir that... Oh, oh no, Charles said quietly, backing away. Quickly backing away. Quietly, quickly. From Foreman Flecutano, I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> Good, the foreman said shortly. Now get up, midgets. Lunch is over. The children sighed and stood up. They had long ago given up trying to convince Foreman Flecutano that they weren't midgets. They waved goodbye to Charles and walked slowly to the waiting bundle of to the waiting bundle of wards with Foreman Fleck Utano walking behind them. And at that moment, one of the children had a trick played on him, which I hope has never been played on you. This trick involves sticking your foot out in front of a person who is walking. So the person trips and falls on the ground. A, pol a policeman did it to me once when I was carrying a crystal ball belonging to a gypsy fortune teller. 
who never forgave me for tumbling to the ground and shattering her ball into hundreds of pieces. It is a mean trick, and it is easy to do, and I'm sorry to say that Foreman Flecutano did it to Klaus right at that moment. Klaus fell right to the ground of the lumber mill. His glasses fell off his face and skidded over to the bundle of boards. Hey, Klaus said, you tricked me. One of the most annoying aspects of this sort of trick is that the person who does it usually pretends not to know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about, Foreman Flecutano said. Klaus was still an too annoyed to argue. He stood up and Violet walked over to fetch her, his glasses, but when she leaned over to pick them up, she saw at once that something was very, very wrong. Right up, Sonny shrieked, and she spoke the truth. When Klaus's glasses had skidded across the room, they had scraped against the floor and hit the boards rather hard. Violet picked the glasses up, and they looked like a piece of model, modern sculpture a friend of mine made long ago. The sculpture was called Twisted, Cracked, and Hopelessly Broken. My brother's glasses, Violet cried. They're twisted and cracked. They're hopelessly broken. And he can scarcely see anything without them. Too bad for you, Foreman Flecutano said, struggling, shrugging at Klaus. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Charles said. He needs a replacement pair, Foreman Flecutano. A child could can't a child could see that. Not me, Klaus said. I can scarcely see anything. Well, take my arm, Charles said. There's no way you can work in a lumber mill without being able to see what you're doing. I'll take you to the eye doctor right away. Oh, thank you, Violet said, relieved. Is there an eye doctor nearby, Klaus asked. Oh, yes, Charles replied. The closest one is Dr. Orwell, who wrote that book you were talking about. Dr. Orwell's office is just outside the door of the mill. Hmm, I'm sure you noticed it on your way here. It's made to look like a giant eye. Come on, Klaus. Oh, no, Charles, Violet said. Don't take him there. Charles cupped his hand to his ear. What did you say, he shouted. Phil had flipped a switch on the string machine, and the ball of string had begun to spin inside its cage, making a loud whirling sound as the employees got back to work. That building has the mark of Count Olaf, Klaus shouted, but Foreman Flacutano had begun to clang his pots together, and Charles shook his head to indicate he couldn't hear. Yar, yar, Sonny shrieked. But Charles just shrugged and led Klaus out of the mill. The two bottler sisters looked at one another. The whirling sound continued, and Foreman Fleck Utano kept on clanging his pots. But that wasn't the loudest sound the two girls heard. Louder than the machine, louder than the pots, was the sound of their own furiously beating hearts as Charles took their brother away. Okay, we'll continue with chapter six in the next video.